First John. We're going to be at First John chapter two, and we're looking at a part of First John chapter five. The way that we walk with Christ is the proof to the world about the relationship that we profess in Christ. Right? I mean, the way that we live is the proof of the relationship that we say we have. If someone says that they are a believer in Christ, but they live the way of the world, then John's saying that's a lie. Right? And you know what most people say in culture today? When someone professes Jesus and lives like there isn't one, they say they're a liar. That's, that really hasn't changed much. The only place it looks for grace in that is the church. And so that's the dangerous thing. We talked about that last week. The why for the reason that John is writing this letter is because he wants us. In chapter 5 of this letter, he says, I want all of you who believe in the name of Jesus that you would have eternal life. Because the best life and the good life, that sweet spot in life, is found when you experience your life in Christ. That goodness, that mercy, that faithfulness, that forgiveness, that 10,000 pounds the pressure of life puts on you that he sets you free from. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That feeling that you have whenever you were full of shame and you were full of guilt and you were broken. And then Jesus starts putting you back together again. He frees you of that. It's the best feeling in the world. Now, some of you believe it, and by the end of service, maybe you all will believe it. Like, it's like, Jesus is the best thing ever. Like, I mean, if you say so. <laughs> no, he really is a big deal. So what, what happens for us is you will hear people say things like, man, I gave up everything for Jesus. No, you didn't. You gave up nothing for everything. Like, I got saved when I was 19 years old, and I had a path lined out, things I thought I was going to do. And yes, I thought it was a big deal, but I can promise you this. I gave up nothing in comparison to the everything that Jesus gave me. My life would have been full of destruction. My marriage wouldn't have made it. My children wouldn't have had a father at home. I know that. So I didn't give up anything. I gave up nothing, and I came to Christ and received everything. It's a beautiful, this, this life, that is the sweet spot. That is the thing that happens in our life. What we've been using so far is this illustration of a suitcase. Now, this is a suitcase, a representation of my life because it's vintage. It's got some wear and tear. Stylish. Right, is that what you think of me when you say stylish? No, not at all. That's why it's funny. We've talked about it from the first week. We've talked about the importance of what I care everywhere I go, whether I fly domestic or international, I still carry my passport. Why? Because I need everybody to know who I am. Right? I, I, don't, but I don't hand over my license. I hand this over everywhere I go because of the authority as a citizen that it gives me. And I will tell you that in this kingdom of God, I have authority. I am a stranger to this land. I'm a foreigner. I'm an alien to this world because I am not living for this world. I'm living for an eternity. I'm looking for a city whose builder and architect is God. And what I can't do is become so attached to this, to this life that I'm not looking forward to the next one. The reason that I don't get all stressed out over and over and over about tough times is because I'm just passing through. I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit. I'm a child of the Most High God. And if God is for me, he's more than the world against me. Amen? Well, y'all warming up. It's going to get there. Having to work for it today. We are passing through. This is the temporary. That is the eternal, right? And then last week, we talked about the way that if God has saved us and we are in fellowship with him, that's what brings them joy. John then says, if you have fellowship with God, you will not have fellowship with darkness because God is light. And light casts out all darkness. And last week, but I don't go, look, I carry this in my truck most time anywhere I go somewhere just because I like to light things up. The point of it is that Jesus is the light of the world. Cast out the darkness, the powers, the principalities. If you have darkness, you've got to shine some light on it. But what ends up happening is, is there are shadows that the enemy creates because his goal is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The light of God is trying to shine on your life, but your disobedience is bringing a shadow. What is disobedience? It is unrepentant sin. It's when you don't repent. So the, the sin gets in between you and the Lord, and it casts a shadow. And the longer that you take to repent and confess of that sin, the bigger the shadow becomes. All you have to do is shine some light on it. 
So we've been learning. We're like, hey, this is what it means. I'm here temporarily. I have fellowship with him, and I've been sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm a son or a daughter of the Most High King. I'm his child. I'm his. He owns me, and I it belong to him, and I'm going to live by that mindset. That's, we've settled that. We've settled the fact that we need to shine some light on it. But now we understand that. Now we've got to put some action to it, and we've got to put the shoes of faith on, and we've got to walk in what we've learned. You've got to walk in what you learn because knowledge without transformation is just an education. An education may make you more knowledgeable, but if you don't apply it, it has done nothing transformational for you. We're not trying to become overeducated past our level of obedience. If I learn it, I need to apply it. If I apply it, God wants to do it in my life. That's what I'm trying to learn. I'm learning so I can apply it. His word is transformational to our life. His truth, the light shines on it. Gives us a chance to become more like Jesus. And John is writing this letter. He's writing this letter to the churches of Asia Minor, what we know as modern Turkey, and you have to understand that he's older in age, well in his 80s or older, and he is not able to travel to them, but he's got to write a letter to circulate through the churches so that they can stay true in what godly doctrine is. Because there are people that are preaching a heretical message. They're coming in and saying, if you have grace, it doesn't matter how you live. And that's heresy. There will be more people in hell because of that heretical message than anything else. Because people that don't live for God understand they've got a destiny. But people that say they live for God, but they say they believe in Jesus, but live like there isn't one and cover that with grace, that's a dangerous place to be. And so what he's saying is you've got to know the truth, and the truth will set you free, and it'll give you a chance to have relationship with him. If you've missed it, guess what? I've got good news. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you are faithful to confess and repent, what's he gonna do? He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from your sin and make you righteous. That's the beauty of God's grace. But just because you have grace doesn't mean that you become complacent and you become settled or you become lazy. Now, I know none of you are lazy, so John's talking to some people there. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Well, John, was, John wasn't afraid to throw some truth out, right? Because nobody's better when you walk around softly not speaking truth. If he had sent them a letter that didn't speak directly to the truth of which was being preached against, it would have done them no good. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Do you know what the will of God is? Walking in obedience to what he's asked of you. That's the will of God. 1 John 5, verse 4 and 5 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So today we're going to put our shoes on and we're going to walk out our faith. It's time to get past what we're learning and put some shoes on and walk this out so that people can see it. They can see that the people of God are marked by faith and that faith causes obedience. Putting my shoes on. Why? We need faith. You don't want to know why we need faith? Because we have an enemy that desires to keep us from the life that God has for us. So we have to live it by faith. And it's nothing new. The enemy's been doing this a long time, y'all. In the beginning, God spoke everything into existence. And when God got ready to make man, he didn't speak man into existence. He formed man from the dust of the earth, got his hands dirty, and the fingerprints of God is all over us. It's what the word calls the Imago Dei, the image of God. We are made in the image of God. That means birds and fish and little puppy dogs don't have what his people have. 
We are created. And you may love your cats. I don't know why. But they're not more valuable than a soul God has made. There you are. So you don't like cats. I found it. It's one of those things to understand. that man, Look, there's nothing more. God loves people. God created man in his own image, and he saw that man was alone, and it wasn't good, and God gave him a woman, and men, God did a good thing, right? That was very weak, and I apologize to all the ladies in the room on the weakness of that amen, and I'm going to give you another chance because that was disrespectful to your wife. <laughs> God saw that man was alone. He said, this is not a good thing. So God made a helper for him, took her from his side, and God gave man, woman, and God said that it was good. All right, I'm trying to save your marriage. So somebody's like, amen. Amen. You can say, you didn't ride with us to church, preacher. April and I ride separate to church. <laughs> Devil try to get you on the way to church. Don't say amen. Do not say amen. We need faith. We need faith because the enemy desires to keep us from that. In the beginning, God made man in his own image. God took him through the garden. He said, you can eat of any tree that you want. Just don't eat of this one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat of this tree. And what did the enemy do? The enemy slithered on the ground. He slithered up in the snake form. And he said, did God really say Do you understand that the enemy has been trying to challenge the ideology of the truth of what God has said from the very beginning of time? That's what he does. It is the world's way. This is the world's kingdom mentality is to make you doubt and lose faith in what God has promised to you. That why in the world, if they could eat of any tree, and this is the Garden of Eden, this is a beautiful place, a holy place, a righteous place. This is the, the blessed place that God has for Adam and Eve. And what happens? They allow one tree that they couldn't eat of the fruit of for an enemy to trick them into saying, I want what I can't have. And we've been messed up ever since. Take a little kid and say, don't touch that. It's hot. Ah, oh, it hurt. It does hurt. Why well, I said don't touch it, stupid. But that's to mean you shouldn't say stupid. I know. Pray for me. I need your prayers. Try to prevent you from doing it. The enemy's, oh, no, it's not going to hurt you. Oh, God doesn't want you to be like him. Did it make him like God? You know what the enemy doesn't lead with? The truth. He leads with a lie. Oh, if you just walk away from your family, it'd be better over here. Is it better? Not at all. Oh, if you just walk away from God and you start finding peace in these other things, it'll make you, it'll give you comfort. Does it bring comfort? No. Because that's what he does. He lies, and it takes faith to trust. He says, you can eat of any tree but this one. Did God really say? And faith is the ability to trust in what God says, even when your flesh is screaming something different. If I were to put myself in that place, the enemy may not slide up to me and say, did God really say you can't eat that fruit? But if I were in that situation, faith would be the opposite of what that temptation is. Faith would say, devil, stay where you belong under my feet. I'm not going to eat of that tree because i got access to all the rest I want. Faith focuses on the promises of God, and the temptation of the enemy is to distract you so that your perspective changes and you can just see what you don't have instead of focusing on what God's blessed you with. Faith says, it's good. God is still good. I don't eat to that tree, but I don't have to because I got the rest of these trees to eat from. And faith gives us the eyes to see and to walk in truth. So John's teaching us something here. John's teaching his church something here, and here's what he's teaching. He's teaching us, number one, that we are not to love this world. Well, pastor, what does John 3.16 say? Say, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have life everlasting. That's what it says. But you have to understand the use of the word world here is different in John 3.16 than it is in 1 John chapter 2. The world that John is writing there in John 3.16 is talking about the people, the, the, the souls that God has created. God loves people. The heartbeat of God is people. There's not a soul that God has made that he doesn't love. 
But what John is talking about now in his letter is the powers and the principalities. Here's how the world is defined in this passage. The world here refers to an organized system of operation hostile to God, led by Satan. He's teaching us we're not to love this world. Guess what? John 17, verse 15 and 16, Jesus said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. He's teaching us that we are not in the world, that we are in this world, but we're not of this world, right? I'm passing through. This is not my home. This is not the only place. I am not going to go to hell over a temporary season of my life. I'm built, I was created to live for an eternity with God. My spirit redeemed, my soul restored, and my flesh submitted. I have an opportunity to live in the blessing of God and the provision of God. So I'm not going to fall so in love with this world that I go to hell for it. He said, you're in it, but you're not of it. Why? Because love in the world leads us away from the Father's will for our lives. James 4.4 4 says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You're like, man, so we're not to love the world. It's what John's teaching us. He's teaching us, too, that the world uses all that is in it to keep us from walking towards Christ. And then he lists them out. That's the first thing he said. He said, lust of the flesh. Yeah, it could be pervertedness. It could be looking upon someone that is not your spouse. And those things, it was talking about appetites, what you hunger for. Like, is God talking about Twinkies? Probably not. I mean, look, it's not, a, oh, I could, uh, so I'm hungry. All, so you're saying I can't be hungry for food. No, you can be hungry for food, but you shouldn't let food on you. Right? You don't hear gluttony talked about very much, do you? Because in Alabama, it's not a sin. Is that what they say? Like, I ain't never struggled with gluttony because I, I don't get full. I just get tired. You know what I'm saying? I'm raking that food up in there. I just get wore out. I got to take a break. I ain't gluttony. But can I tell you, things will want to own you. Your appetites are going to want to own you. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The appeal of it, the appeal to our flesh, the lust of the flesh, the appetites, the desires, the, oh, I want it, I want it, I want it. And then he says, the lust of the eyes. Do you know what I think the lust of the eyes really is a lot of? is the comparison trap that we fall into. Looking at somebody else and wondering why they got it so good, why we have it so bad. I mean, social media has not helped this, right? No doubt hasn't helped this. We look at stuff on social media. Oh, it's somebody. Will put, look, most people don't lead with their worst stuff, right? If they do, they get blocked. <laughs> people ain't got time for it, right? They don't want to read all that drama. Most people are least like, Oh, my family they take pictures that like they're five year old, they're four year old, and they're two year old, and they're like, "Oh, my kids had the house clean when I got home, and they cooked dinner, and they mopped the floor with a toothbrush." Hashtag blessed with a selfie. And there you are looking through Facebook, and then look at your circus. <laughs> I'm the worst parent ever. You weren't really there; they just happened to catch a good moment. Who would be dumb enough to think a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old clean the house anyway? People they ain't got nothing better to do than look at Facebook, right? <laughs> or social, or, or Instagram, or, or however Snapchat works in that way, <laughs> the public stories they post, or whatever the social media thing is. That It's a comparison trap. You start comparing. It's like, oh, well, they have. And what it does is it robs us of an opportunity to be grateful and thankful for what God has given us. So, I mean, it's the craziest thing ever is that in the body of Christ, why would we not celebrate the wins that God gives us with each other? Like if God blesses you, why wouldn't I say, man, I'm so thankful. That's awesome, man. That's, that's stupid great. I'm so thankful God bless you that way. Instead, what you see a lot of is like, hmm, well, I mean, I guess if I... Well, I guess if my parents had given me something, I, who cares? 
Why would you be jealous? That's your brother in Christ. That's your sister in Christ. Why would you ever be jealous of what God blessed them with? Because you got some lust in your eyes. Start getting jealous. Oh, oh, look, April and I, so it's the one thing that was so baffling to me whenever I became a Christian. April and I got married. We started having babies. And we were youth pastoring in Louisiana. We go to youth camp. And April, have a baby. We go to youth camp. Have a baby, go to youth camp. Have a baby, go to youth camp. So we quit going to youth camp. I'm just kidding. There was, it, was one of those, it was one of those things where we're, we're three or four years in going, and one of these other leaders in the same district where we were, where we were serving comes up after we've been going to camp for three or four years, and she comes up, and she says, I just want you to know I hated you for three years. Well, how are you supposed to respond to that? Now, see, my wife isn't as witty as me. She's like, I... I just want you to know I hated you for three years. Had them babies and just looking like a Barbie three weeks later. I'd have been like, well, that's because you're stupid. <gasps> well, they dumb enough to come up and say something dumb. They're going to get something dumb back. I'm like, oh, Lord, bless you. Or do you rebuke them? I rebuke that devil of comparison. It ain't my fault that you don't care, right? I mean, is that what you're supposed to say? Why does it matter? Why does it even matter? Because people aren't happy. Here's what I've learned. Is people are happy when you're not as blessed as they are. But you start getting blessed, they become jealous. And I'm going to tell you something. There ain't no room in the body of Christ for that. There's not. April's going to get on to me for saying this. But I don't care what you have. She's like, well, you shouldn't say I don't care. What I mean is, is look, if God's blessed you, invite us over. We'll play on it. <laughs> That's the way I see it. Man, let's play. <laughs> God bless you with a big old deer hunting ranch. Let's go. I'm not going to get back and be like, God never lets me go deer hunting in a big place. God doesn't love me as much as he loves them. It's just deer hunting. <laughs> it didn't die for you. It ain't coming back for you, so don't go to hell over it. Lust the eyes, the jealousy. I'm so jealous. Oh, they drive this or they live here. Who cares? It's just a covering over your head, honey child. It ain't going to save you. So don't get so fed up with things and think, oh, well, I can't sit with her or do this. We ain't in middle school anymore I'm trying to figure out which lunch table we're going to sit at. John was spin some truth. He said, the lust, the pride of life. You know what? This is the pride of one's possessions. Here's the way I would say it. We've said this for years and years here. God isn't against you having things. He's just against things having you. That's all. And here's the easiest way to answer that. Would you still love Jesus the same if you didn't have what you had? Would you still love Jesus the same? If you didn't have something in your bank account, if you didn't have the house you had or the car you drove or any of the other hobbies you get to participate in or the possessions that you own or the toys, would you still love Jesus the same or would you walk away from him because you think he's mad at you? I'm sure I'm glad Job didn't think that way. I'm glad Job didn't say, well, God, you took this from me, and now I ain't going to love you no more. Now, yeah, he had his bad moments, but when God spoke to him, it changed, and God gave everything back to him. But you know what the enemy did? He said, there ain't nobody that just loves you because you're God. They love you because of what you do for them. Have you considered my servant Job? Yeah, he's got these things. You don't have these things. He won't love you. He's like, take them. Let me tell you, there's a lot of people who rip their Christian bumper sticker off if they start losing some things. Why? Because that's the pride of life. There's nothing wrong. Man, God's blessed me. I, if God's blessed me, I'm going to give the credit to the one who blessed me. But if I don't have it, if everything changes tomorrow and the economy changes and everything goes different, guess what? I can say as Paul said, I've had little and I've had much. I've learned that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's contentment. Oh, oh, if I don't have a bougie throne and if I, if I don't have my bougie little facial in three weeks, I ain't going to be able to love Jesus no more. No, you'll go buy some lotion at Walmart and figure it out.
Uh-huh. I'm smiling. I ain't going to be able to get that pedicure. It's weird anyway. <laughs> All the dudes said amen. The women's like, I will stone you, bro. You better shut up. <laughs> and he says, and he's saying, and the third thing he's teaching us, he says, you're not to live for the world that is passing away but for the eternal. This is what Matthew 16 says in 24 through 27. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This is right after the 1618 that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. I can remember. April and I were first married. She was finishing up beauty school before we went to Bible college, and we was broke as the Ten Commandments. I mean, broke, broke. Laying in bed, she's crying. I'm a dude. I want to fix the crying. Baby, what's wrong? She's like, these girls I'm with in beauty school, they're, they're going out. They're partying. They're sleeping around. They're, they're buying new cars, and they got new houses, and We've lost every. I was like, April, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose their soul? She says, you're right. Now, I can tell you, I was like, thank you, God, because that was not me. <laughs> that was not me. Because I, I just started, I mean, we were brand new saved then. I mean, I started in the Gospel of Matthew, and thank the Lord, I'd made it to chapter 16 by then. I had just read that. Like, she said that. I was like, what was the profit a person to get, gain the whole world but to lose their soul? She's like, you're right. And I'm like, whew. So I wouldn't be able to fix that one. I'm like, let's go see if we can get financed. <laughs> that would have been my other response. And then he's saying, look, you know what? You overcome the world by your faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of of God. How did they overcome the devil? Revelation 12, 11 says, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Your testimony is the faith in which you live out the obedience of Christ in your life. So how can you live it out? How can you put your shoes on? I'm glad you asked because this is what faith does for us. It gets us in the game. It's putting the shoes on and running this race. The writer of Hebrews says, who I believe is Dr. Luke, says that we will have an opportunity to lay aside every weight, not let the sin that so easily entangles, and we run this race with perseverance. That's what this faith does. It's what does this, this relationship with Jesus have to do with my life? It's this faith marked out that says, I will not shrink back when the pressure gets turned up. Why is John writing this? Because John wrote from experience, y'all. You got to remember, he was a part of the birth of the New Testament church too. He walked with Jesus. He saw the miracles that Jesus performed. He was, he was close with Jesus, and he saw him ascend into heaven. And he was a part of the explosion of the New Testament church. And it took faith to do what they did. He's writing to them, you need this faith to be an overcomer. In his old age, he's writing to them from his experiences that he has lived out. And you're like, oh, is that even in the Bible? You better believe it's in the Bible. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 says, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the Scriptures. And they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Do you want to know what your faith does? It proves to the world that you've been with Jesus. Gives us boldness to live it and to speak it. We have this saying that people, well, I'm going to preach the gospel and use words if I have to. Listen to me, people. You better use words too. Because there's Muslims trying to do good things and Mormons trying to do good things and all kinds of other cults trying to do good things and not people that are in heretical situations. You better preach the gospel with your words too. That's why, he, that's why he's teaching. I'm going to give you the right theology so when you live out your faith, you can tell them why you're doing it, not just what you're doing. 
I sat in Africa talking to a group of pastors looking to launch a church, celebration church in, in Zimbabwe, a campus for us. And, you know, when you go into someone else's territory and you have a conversation, I mean, the last thing I, like if a pastor came here and, and brought all of the, the town pastors together and said, hey, I want to come plant a church here because I don't think y'all are doing good enough. That's not what they would say, but it was like, hey, we're supposed to come plant a church here because hmm, maybe y'all aren't serving the way you should serve. So I wanted to have a meeting with the pastors to say, look, I want to come here and have a chance to partner. And we had a, a great open conversation because the last thing I want to do is go into a foreign soil and become abrasive for them and not have blessing and partnership. And the pastor that was leading that group stood up and says, pastor, we want you to come. We want you to come because there are all kinds of other religions moving into the area and say, look where Christianity has gotten you. You're still poor. You still live in a hut. We'll give you these things if you will pledge your allegiance. And look, that's why we never pledge our allegiance to things. We pledge our allegiance to Christ. That's why you'll never hear a prosperity gospel preached here because that's heretical. The gospel we preach works in the huts of a third world country just as much as it does in the bougie of the eastern shore. I'm going to get in trouble for that one, hi. <laughs> That's one of those. It works. The gospel works everywhere, amen? This faith is what does that. John had experienced this. That faith that he's talking about, he's talking about that overcoming faith. That faith caused him to pray. In Acts 4, 23 and 24, you read further, it says, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer because they had been released from prison. They reported all that they had said, and, and they got together in prayer to God. Can I tell you, your faith causes you to pray big prayers. Let's be honest. Most of the time, we just pray little video prayers. God, be with us. He's with you. If you love Jesus and you live for him, he's with you. God, be with me. He's like, I never left you. My word taught you that, dummy. I'll never leave you and never forsake you. Lord, be with me. Do you not feel me? Do you not see me? <laughs> I ain't playing with you. I'm with you until the end of the age. <laughs> Lord, be with us. Like I'm about to do something he don't like. Lord, bless this food. Sometimes, the only time some of us pray is over a meal. That's why some of you take so long to bless your food. <laughs> Let's eat, baby. Come on. Lord, bless it in Jesus' name. Pray and take all that time some other time. I don't know why it takes five minutes to bless a meal. You're either super grateful. It's the only time you pray. That's free. That wasn't even in the notes. Causes us to pray. Look, don't, don't stop praying for small things, but pray for some big things. Can you imagine? Like when you start reading Acts chapter 4 and you see what Peter and John did is, is they stretch out their hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of the holy servant Jesus. That's what they did. Did you know why? Because the miracles that God will do through your life in faith, you know what signs do? They point to the one who orchestrated it. They point to the real thing. The miracles in the church, outside the church, is what brought the move of the New Testament church, the faith. That's why Peter and John, when they were on the way to the temple to preach the gospel, they saw a, blind, they, they saw a crippled beggar at the temple gate beautiful, and he was begging for money. He'd been placed there for a long time. And they said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. Can I tell you, the miracles that God wants to do through your life is the faith that you walk out and your along the way moments, the shoes that you put on and walk out. Jesus wants to touch somebody's life and he needs you to have faith to see the miraculous happen in your time. God wants to use you. Stop settling for mediocrity. Stop living with just whatever's prescribed. Just know that God wants to work a miracle. So stop saying, oh Lord, be with us. Going, Lord, raise this person up. Lord, raise them up. Lord, I believe you for marriages to be restored. Someone's like, my marriage ain't working. In Jesus' name, your marriage can be saved. Instead of just settling, oh, it's too tough. I'll never love again. My heart was broken. In Jesus' name, you'll trust again. The miraculous is a lot better than the ordinary. Faith does that, y'all. John's why John is so big on this walking your faith out. Faith isn't weird. 
Faith isn't this, oh, I, I'm going to have to like get a tambourine and a banner and that's what faith. No, it doesn't. Praying, praying, praying for God. You know what? Prayer, when you live by that faith, you don't hesitate. You pray first. You say, you know what? My faith is big enough to handle a no or a not yet because I'm walking this out. I want you to stand with me today. And I'm going to close in this last point. And the most important thing that I believe John is teaching us through this opportunity about faith is that faith causes us, listen to me, look right here. Faith causes us to walk in obedience. Causes us to walk in obedience. And do you know what obedience to God normally does? It normally triggers opposition from the enemy. Acts 5, they arrested the apostles and put them in jail. Second time in prison in one day. What do they say? God, I want to partner with the power of your spirit. And I want you to use my life, Lord, and spend me as currency in your hands. And then they go to arrest him like, God, I was playing. I was playing. I use me as long as it don't bother me or get in and inconvenience me. No, it usually triggers opposition. And look, this may sound harsh, but I'm just trying to communicate truth. If you're not ready to face opposition from the enemy, then maybe you're not ready to be obedient to Christ. Because your obedience will bring opposition. That's why the heretical message that the church has preached in, in, in the American gospel, if you give your life to Jesus, you'll never have another bad day. That's heresy. The devil's going to unleash hell on you. And you better know in whom you've had an encounter with so you can stand in the face of obstacles and opposition. When the devil's fighting you, it's because you're not walking the same direction as him. Come on. It's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. It's going to have opposition, but it's also going to release the miracle of God. you got to think about it. They was put in prison and God set them free. Brought, broke them out of the prison. Dr. Luke didn't even make a big deal out of it. He's like, man, eh, it's just a miracle. It's normal. When you walk in obedience, you're not surprised by those things. But it always requires faith. Faith. So where they started in faith, they end up again. Back in Acts 5, they go and stand in the temple courts, he said, and he said, tell the people the full message of this new life in Christ. It wasn't easy. It was outside the comfort zone. God didn't tell them a lot. He told them one thing. He said, go and stand and preach. You want to know why God tells you one thing? Because he needs you to have faith to trust him with the details. Because if God gave you every detail, you wouldn't need faith to walk by it. You would already see it and know it. But when God asks you, you trust him and you step out and towards him in faith. Now, Simon Peter may miss it a lot in his life, but I can promise you this. Simon Peter did what nobody else besides Jesus ever did, and he walked on the water temporarily, but he still stepped where no other man besides Jesus ever did. And I'd rather fail walking by faith towards Jesus where he can lift me up than sitting in the boat wondering what it would have been like. It gives us a chance. It gives us a chance. Faith does that. So look, God didn't give us relationship with Jesus, so we just sit on our lazy rears and do nothing with it. He didn't give us light to cast out darkness, so we brag about how bright we are. He gives us faith, so we put our shoes on and go into a world that desperately needs it and say, because I've encountered Jesus, I want you to know you can have this truth, this hope, this life that delivers you and sets you free. It's not a weak faith. It's not a weak gospel. It is a, it is a violent kingdom waging war against a kingdom of darkness. God wants to use you. God wants to partner with you. God wants you to walk this out in faith. Every head bowed, every eye closed, so I wrap up today. Look today, some of you, your step of faith is gonna be real simple. You need to come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That has to happen. And the Holy Spirit is moving through this room. And if you are far from God and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is your day. And here's how you become a follower of Jesus. 
The Word of God tells us in the book of Romans that we, if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead and He sits at the right hand of God, we can be saved. So we confess that Jesus is Lord, not a Lord. We confess that Jesus is our Lord. We repent of our sins and we ask Jesus to make us new. So today, our prayer team is going to come and they're going to find a place up here in the front of this room. Maybe today you want to walk that aisle and you want to find one of them and you want them to lead you in that prayer. You can do that. Or maybe today you want to say this prayer right where you are and all you have to do is pray a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, save me. Make me new. Be my Lord and my Savior. Never the same from this day forward. In Jesus' name. You pray that prayer, you can be saved. Now put your shoes on and walk out this faith. That's one of That's one group. Second group is going to be a deal where you know God has been speaking to you, but you become so complacent and comfortable that you're not trusting God for the miraculous because you got it all under control. When's the last time you did anything by faith? Your pocketbook probably doesn't even say you have faith. You probably haven't sowed any other kingdom but your own in a long time. And God is, what does your faith say about you? We have an opportunity to step out of the comfort zone and into the miraculous. You've been nervous and you've been scared, but it's time to start trusting and stop having confidence in yourself. Because if you didn't need God to do it, then he's not a part of it. God only wants you to do what takes him to make it happen. You've been trying to fix your marriage. You can't fix your marriage. Jesus can fix your marriage. You've been trying to fix your kids. You can't fix your kids. Jesus can fix your kids. You've been trying to run your business. You can't do it as good as he can. You've been trying to change your workplace. You can't. He's the only one that can do that. And you've got to live that faith out. Live that faith out. Step out. Take a step of faith. Put your shoes on and walk it out past hurt and pain has caused you to close off and isolate and it's time by faith to step back in and say I'm going to trust again I'm going to love again this is your opportunity trust God by faith he'll work out the details so right now just for a moment I want you to have a moment with God and I want you to just ask the Lord Lord what does this message have to do with me today and allow him to speak